everyone. Welcome. This is the January 15th, 2020 City Council meeting. I am Shirley Shara and I will be presiding this evening. Um, I'm going to announce that we are being audio and video recorded. And as always, we are going to um, start with public comment. So the public's free to come to speak to us on any topic. It doesn't have to be something on the agenda. Uh, please limit your comments to three minutes. And um, please, when you come to the podium, state your name and the city or town that you're from for our, thank you, um, for our record. And um, per our rules, we don't respond, but please direct your comments towards us, but we don't respond at this time. If you want to uh, circle back with us at another point, um, you could email or call us or at the end of the meeting, but we don't respond during public comment. So there's only one name here, um, which is Amy Bookbinder. And then after Amy, anyone else who wishes to speak who's not on here will be given a chance. Hello, everybody. Um, Amy Bookbinder, Ward 7. Um, hello, everybody. Um, all of you who are new and all of you who are returning, congratulations. As a Ward 7 resident, I want to put on the record how very proud and appreciative I am of the excellent representation we in Ward 7 and all throughout the city received from our now former city councilor, Elisa Klein. I want to thank her for consistent hard work upholding and uplifting true progressive values, inclusive and effective coalition building, and forging ahead sometimes during difficult challenges and through undue criticism by particular city officials. Our ward and I believe the entire city greatly benefited from her tireless and principled work on this council. Many of us were saddened when we learned Elisa would not be returning to the council. She left big shoes to fill, which brings me to my second point, which is that we were equally elated to learn that Rachel Mayori would run for the Ward 7 seat. Those of us who know her personally as a neighbor or a friend, and those of us who know her powerful work as a community organizer for justice, her extreme kindness, her abilities as a great listener interested in all points of view, and in her also great coalition building. She will fill those shoes, we know. We are lucky in Ward 7 and the whole city to have Councillor Maori representing us now. And the council, all of you, I think, are very fortunate to have her join you for the work ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> is there anyone else who would like to speak? OK. My name is Jennifer McKenna. I'm also a Leeds resident. I live at 89 Florence Street. I'm going to echo, of course, everything that Amy said. But I also just wanted very quickly to thank all of you for running, for running again. Um, really, really excited about the city council and really appreciate what you've taken on. Um, congratulations to the new chair. Also very exciting. So just wanted to express that appreciation. Looking forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Kathy McNally from Ward 1. I'm Rachel's friend, I'm delighted that she's part of you, but I'm so delighted to see all of you. You look, you look really great tonight. <laughs> and I'm so happy that Michael Quinlan is my city representative too. So it just feels fun and exciting and I'm delighted to be part of it tonight. Thank you. Any other love someone wants to share? Or <laughs> feel free to also be critical or anything you'd like. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm proud that I live in Northampton. My name is Mo Malek Niaz. I have been living in Northampton for the past 40 years. I have my home in Northampton, Ward 7. And uh, also, I'm an owner, property owner of 233 Main Street, which is next to uh, former Sam Pizza. And uh, I remember Mayor Musanti, who did a great, great job in 
reviving Northampton. Northampton was a, a sleepy town <laughs> when Mayor Musanti took over. And I'm glad that uh, Mayor Narkowitz is uh, heading our <coughs> effort to make Northampton even better. And I'm his supporter. I have voted for him, and uh, I will vote for him again. Uh, tonight, I'm here as a proud citizen of Northampton to uh, oppose the opening of a pot shop in uh, the location of former Sam Pizza. It will, it will change us. It will pain me to see that Northampton is going in that direction. To me, it's the wrong direction. Uh, the note for the pot shop opening is on the glass door for 235 Main Street, as if the pot shop operators consider the opening a foregone conclusion. I'm opposed to opening a pot shop at this location next to my store. Other neighbors of this location feel the same way. And I have their letters stating that <coughs> irreversible harm would come to them if this pot shop opens there. There would be no doubt that a pot shop at this location means that there would be a long line of people waiting to buy a mind-altering drug and police standing there guarding them on the narrow sidewalk in front of my store and the neighbor's properties. This would be exactly as we have seen it at Kansas Street Pot Shop location, since it opened almost a year ago. Surely no responsible citizen would like to duplicate the Kansas Street experience at this crowded Main Street location with narrow sidewalks. There would be no doubt that it will adversely impact customers of my store and other neighbors, neighboring stores. Our business income and our property values will suffer, and it denies availability of very limited parking spaces. My time is over. Yes, please finish your thought. Pardon me? Please finish your thought. OK. <coughs> uh, the parking is a problem, and it will get even worse. People, they use that uh, sidewalk to get to their residential apartment, business apartments, and uh, stores, and simply walking for the joy of walking downtown Northampton. <coughs> it will negatively impact by allowing a pot shop to open at this location. Although the city of Northampton does not issue license for pot shop, but the city do have authority over issuing certificate of occupancy. The pot shop at this location should not receive a certificate of occupancy from the city of Northampton based on the following. This crowded location and narrow sidewalk is not a suitable location for a pot shop. There are numerous safety and building violations at 235 Main Street. Send your inspectors and discover the violations. This is our crowded and bustling Main Street location with narrow sidewalk and very limited parking spaces. Sir, could I ask you to send the, the remainder of your thoughts to us by email or give them to Laura and she'll share them with us? Sure, I can give Thank you. I would exactly what that. I want to say to anybody here. Thank you, and we will share it with the rest of the council. Thank okay. you for your time. I appreciate Wonderful. it. Wonderful. Thank you so much Thank you. for allowing me to Of course. Sorry to cut you off. my concerns. Should I bring it? Yes, please. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak this evening? Thank you. You're, you're welcome to, Bam, if you'd like to. Sure. Yeah, please. <coughs> please just come and state your name and the city or town you're from. And then Hi, my name minutes. is Linda Hannum. I live in Hadley, Massachusetts. I am the proud former owner of Salon Hurtis. Um, my roots have roots, so don't look. Um, <laughs> I, I'm here to support uh, w with Mohammed. It's a challenging situation. Um, I also, I do not own the salon anymore. I do own the property that it's in, the second floor condo association. And it's going to be a very 
difficult challenge. Over the years of owning Salon Herdis, one of the number one challenges from clients when whenever we would do a uh, survey was the number of people they had to step over just to come get their hair cut or getting services. And it's difficult. We try really hard to keep a vibrant uh, community in the, in the center of Northampton. And um, I'm not opposed to the property or the, you know, what is being offered to be sold there. I am opposed to the idea of that's just not the right place to do it. And uh, I also rent two apartments from the Bowles uh, family, which are Sam's Pizzas here, apartment on the second floor, apartment on the third floor. They're all legit. I run them as two Airbnb uh, uh, places. Uh, they're very, very busy. People love it, coming in to look at Smith College, coming in for performances across the street. It's a wonderful location. That doorway will literally be in the middle of this. I don't know how clients and guests will feel coming, having to walk around and through stepping through lines of people waiting to get into any business. It doesn't matter what it is. It just offers a, a deterrent um, necessarily um, that I just, I just don't know that I can really support. It's, then it's another whole conversation about what it is. And um, that's a different, I think a different subject matter. I think the, the, the way the businesses that I've noticed how they had to run, they have to have police there. They only allow five or six people into the, uh, the business established at one time. And if that's the case, there will be a line. Maybe stores like Starbucks will be great. We'll have more people, more downtown traffic for people wanting coffee. But I feel bad for the folks that are doing their darndest to run a successful business in Northampton with selling used clothing and wonderful products. Um, it just, it's, it, I think it would be a detriment. I know you can't respond. It's OK. Just wanted to come over and just throw my two cents in. And I'm going to even stop talking early because we have a lot to do. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you Thanks. for sharing. Is there anybody else who would like to speak tonight? Seeing none, would you like to speak at public comment? No, thanks. OK. <laughs> um, we are going to convene our meeting. So Laura, will you please take the roll? Sure. Thank you. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Foster. Here. Councilor Jarrett. Here. Councilor Labarge. Proudsog. Councilor Mayori. Here. Councilor Nash. Here. Councilor Quinlan. Here. Councilor Sheriff. Here. And Councilor Flora. Here. We are all here. Welcome, everybody. Um, we do not have any public hearings this evening. So next up, we're at updates from, Cal from the Council President and Committee Chairs. Um, I am just going to announce for the public the um, City Council Committee and the Commission appointments that have been made. Um, they are now posted on our website though we're working to um, some of them haven't met yet so that means the officers the chair and the vice chair haven't been elected yet so we're working to get all of that information up um, but i'm going to announce them right now and i will indicate the chairs and vice chairs that have been elected so for legislative matters uh councillor dwight is the chair uh, the other councillors that sit on it are councillor maori councillor thorpe and myself councillor shara finance i am the chair councillor shara um, Councillor Quinlan, Councillor Labarge, and Councillor Thorpe also sit on finance. For community resources, it's Councillor Nash, Councillor Thorpe, Councillor Jarrett, and Councillor Foster. That is not met yet, so those officers have not been elected. For city services, it's Councillor Labarge, Councillor Foster, Councillor Quinlan, and Councillor Maori. Likewise, that is not met yet, so those officers have not been elected. Then to the Transportation and Parking Commission, I recommended Councillor Nash and Councillor Foster, and the mayor accepted those uh, recommendations and has appointed them. For Energy and Sustainability Commission, I recommended Councillor Jarrett and Councillor Maori, and likewise, the mayor accepted those and appointed them. To the Dis Disability Commission, Councillor Labarge is the liaison, and to the Youth Commission, Councillor Dwight is the liaison. So those are the appointments for this term, 2020-2021. Thank you. Are there any other, uh, I know it's new term, but um, any other committee chair uh, announcements or I'm basically looking at you. I, I saw that. So, so far, <laughs> it's just you and me. Right? <laughs> the uh, legislative matters will be meeting in our first meeting in February to discuss the items that will be referred at the end of this meeting, um, the, the zoning proposal changes. And so um, that is an invitation to the public, but also to alert the counselors who are also on the committee that we will be addressing essentially the meat of this meeting uh, 
the second half of the meet of the meet of this meeting. So that. Oh. We discussed that although they could be advertised for your February meeting, that most likely they wouldn't be taken up until March. So I apologize. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. The, so, all right. The ones being referred tonight. I'm so, sure. the ones being referred tonight will not be addressed in our first meeting in February. Um, the Legislative Matters Committee is essentially the last bite of the apple before it comes and items come back before this body. We could move on those, but it's more appropriate to wait to hear from the Planning Board, which could modify, change these ordinances and it would be good to know what their recommendation is before we start addressing it so you're still welcome to come I don't know if we'll have much on the agenda of the base so <laughs> the way it's looking but okay so there's there's a non-announcement okay <laughs> so uh, as the former chair of the TPC um, uh, this earlier this week I sat down with director Lascalia to review what the agenda might be for this week and that since last month's TPC was canceled many of those items are carrying over to this month and uh, the thing I wanted to most uh, uh, get the word out about is that there's two items related to long-term creating long-term parking on Bridge Street near uh, historic Northampton and on uh, Pleasant Street near Northampton Bicycle. And this is in response to uh, last term, towards the end of last term, we, there were some changes made with the depot lot that resulted in changes, uh, pressures on long-term parking downtown. These two zones will be considered for that. And if anybody's interested, next week at four o'clock uh, on Tuesday, those items will be up for discussion. Um, next, we have recognitions and one-minute announcements by councilors. Um, I first wanted to uh, talk about the analysis, let everyone knows the, the analysis of impediments to affordable housing. The mayor uh, just released that, and when I was on the Northampton Housing Partnership, we put that uh, together. And of course, cost of housing is a, is a large impediment, but there are a lot of other ones on there and interesting. Uh, so I recommend that uh, everyone who's interested in affordable housing review that document. Next, a, um, we'll be having a Proposition 2.5 Override Forum in Ward 5, and that's going to be on Tuesday, February 4th at the Florence Civic Center from 7 to 9. And um, finally, um, school committee uh, rep, uh, Dina Levy, and I, the, she's the Ward 5 school committee rep, uh, will be holding uh, just general listening forums in Ward 5 um, at a, a, a number of different locations, public housing meeting rooms, different businesses, library. Um, and um, we welcome your invitation uh, to the to, you know, places that you think uh, would be good places for us to come to. And um, so if you're a Ward 5 resident business and have thoughts on that, please uh, get that to us. Thank you. Council Mary? Um, yeah, well, I just wanted to mention the Pioneer Valley Women's March, which is happening this Saturday. Um, it's the fourth annual march, and this year uh, we're really excited because we've formed a network with uh, folks in the region, and we're going to Springfield. And we plan to rotate the march each year to another uh, city to kind of bring in some regional unity. Um, we uh, have been in contact with Dave the Weathernut, and he somehow contacted the snow and has asked the snow not to come until late afternoon. So we are fine. There will be a, there will be a kind of a great pre-rally um, program with some of the, the counselors from Springfield. That, that will be starting at 11 uh, at Northgate Plaza in Springfield. And we will be then marching to City Hall at 12. We'll start marching. Get to City Hall at uh, probably a little shy of 1 p.m. and we'll have a a short but very um, dynamic program of incredible speakers. We're, this year's theme is unity across communities and we're gonna be focusing on climate justice. We have some incredible performers 
And then at, um, right there at City Hall, we're having an activist fair all afternoon. Uh, 30 organizations will be there to Inside help. City Hall? And that's at City, Springfield City Hall as well. And yeah, there's the Valley Flyer, there's the bus, there's carpooling. Go to pioneervalleywomensmarch.org if you want any inf more information, and I hope you'll we'll see you there. Great. Councilor Quinlan. Uh, I just wanted to congratulate Coach Messer and the Northampton girls basketball team for a terrific win the other night against Central. They haven't beat Central in years, and so it was a really exciting game, very fun. I thought the girls played terrific, and I uh, really enjoyed the game, so I just want to congratulate them. I also was at that game, and it was truly remarkable. I'm so exciting. Um, anybody else? I have one. Um, so the Citizen Police Academy was just announced the dates for it. It's actually on Saturday this time, um, on Saturdays. So uh, it opens that up to our participation. Um, so it runs from February 8th to March 28th. And it's Saturdays from 9 AM to 12 PM. So if you go to the Northampton Police Department website um, under community, you can apply to be part of it. It's, um, I think Councillor Dwight was talking about it at one point. Uh, it's a great program to really understand that department and everything that, um, that happens there. So um, I highly recommend it. And anyone, it's not just for counselors, anybody, it's the Citizen Police Academy because everybody can participate. So um, that's my announcement. None other? No? Nope? Okay. Mr. Mayor, do you have any communications for us? Um, first, congratulations to all the new members. Um, it's great to see you in your new seats. I have to get used to the new order. Um, it seems like was four there before, and what? Yeah, okay. No, so, in order. In order. Okay, good. Right. Just trying to roughly numerical order. Rough order. Excellent. Um, I did want to announce uh, last night was the first of my several scheduled town hall meetings around the city uh, to discuss with residents the scheduled Tuesday, March 3rd, 2020, uh, Proposition 2 and a half override. Um, next week's will be in. Uh, uh, January 22nd on Wednesday at 7 o'clock at the Little Theater in the high school. Um, we've got a complete schedule that's all listed on the um, city website. We have set up a special uh, web page with lots of information, including um, copies of the presentation, uh, media, um, schedule, um, you know, schedule of the meetings. We've got information about exemptions for seniors. And we also have a calculator that allows people uh, to put in to search their name, their address, um, and see exactly what the impact of the $2.5 million proposed um, um, override uh, would be on their particular property. So I hope that people will take the time to um, come out and uh, join the conversation about this important um, vote that we will all be taking as a community on March 3rd. Thank you. Thank you for that. I was there last night, as were some other counselors, and it's a very thorough um, and impressive presentation that I think will answer a lot of people's questions. So thank you for it. You're welcome. And the um, the link on the, if you go to the mayor's page, it's the top link. Uh, it's, it says 2020 Proposition 2.5 Override. So you click on that, and it'll give you all the information about the meetings and about other questions people may have. Thank, thank you. you. So we have no presentations uh, at this point in the agenda, though there are some on the finance agenda. Um, and we have no resolutions today. So we're moving to the consent agenda. So the consent agenda, we only take one reading on the consent agenda. And there is no discussion on the item unless you, unless you ask to remove an item. So if you have something that you want to discuss, um, before we take the vote, you ask for a removal, and then we will vote on the consent agenda as a whole, and everything in there, the vote that you take, will count for that entire agenda, except for whatever has been removed, which we'll then discuss separately. So, um, so what I look for for the consent agenda is a motion to approve. Motion, motion, motion to approve the Second. consent agenda. Made by Councilor Joyce. Second. Seconded by Councilor Nash, I think. Thank you. Any removals? Uh, I'd like to remove the minutes of uh, December 19th. OK. We will take those minutes out of there. Um, so that's, those are the minutes of December 19th, and the, uh, which are now removed and we'll, we will discuss separately. So the rest of the consent agenda consists of two items. This is 20.103 appointments to various committees. These are for referral to the City Services Committee. Um, so first is to the Board of Assessors, David Murphy, 78 North Elm Street, Northampton, for the term January 2020 to June 2023. This is a to fill a newly created seat on the Board of Assessors. 
And second is the planning board, Melissa Fowler, 87 Chesterfield Road in Leeds, term January 2020 to June 2021. This is to fill the unexpired term of Mark Sullivan. Um, so, as I said, we don't discuss those items. So, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda? Please aye. say aye. 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 Any objections? <coughs> Any abstentions? Those items are approved. So now we're going to go back and, and to the minutes. So, <coughs> Councillor Jarrett? Um, there are a number of items uh, starting with 19.180. And um, that's on page 676. It's listed. Um, that say that the rules were suspended and it was passed two readings and enrolled. But those items, um, that was the second reading. So I don't believe any rules were suspended for, for that, the, that to pass. answer as to why that wording is there but she says it's been in the records since like the 1800s <laughs> and she she was not comfortable with me removing that and so I haven't gotten a complete explanation but I have by myself questioned that and um, perhaps we can we'll, we'll keep working on an answer okay. yeah that. Okay. any were there any other no. anyone else have anything about these minutes that you'd like to discuss Okay, is there a motion to, so if, if that's okay, we will, <coughs> doing what we've been doing since the 1800s and <laughs> until we get an answer otherwise. <laughs> um, so is there a- I move to the minutes of December Second. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor of accepting these minutes, please say aye. 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 Any objections? Any abstentions? Okay. So those have passed. Um, so now we are going to recess for the Finance Committee, which meets within the City Council. Um, so the Council recesses for finance, and the Chair hands uh, the gavel over to the Chair of Finance. You've all learned, I'm the Chair of Finance, so sorry, <laughs> no break for me, guys. Um, so we're now, we've now moved into the Finance Committee. And everyone may participate. It's also, it's co-posted as a Northampton City Council meeting. So anyone can participate, but only finance committee members may vote, okay? So, Laura, will you please take the role for finance? Councilor Shara. Here. Councilor Quinlan. Here. Councilor Lavar. Present. And Councilor Thorpe. Here. Great. Um, our first order of business is approval of the minutes from December 19th, 2019. There's been a motion made by Councilor LaBarge to approve. Second. Seconded by Councilor Quinlan. All those, any discussion on these minutes? No. All those in favor of approving these minutes, please say aye. 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 Any objections? Abstentions? No. Okay. Those have been approved. So next up, we have a presentation from the finance director, Susan Wright, who is going to talk to us about the second quarter financial report. So we are halfway through the fiscal year. We run on a fiscal year, which starts July 1st. Um, and quarterly, Susan comes and gives us a report on how we're doing. Okay. So thank you so much, Susan, for doing this. All right, so I'm going to, I've sent you four reports two revenue reports, two expenditure reports. So I'm gonna start with the general fund. The general fund is the largest fund in the city. Um, it is the fund you think of when you think of city services. It's schools, it's police, it's fire, it's all of general government, uh, you know, arts and culture, et cetera, the libraries. It's, it's pretty much, it's the general fund. It, it is the biggest fund in the city. The other, um, funds that I report on to you are the enterprise funds, and those consist of four self-contained, self-supporting utilities that the city has. One is water, <coughs> the second one is sewer, the third one is solid waste, and the fourth one is stormwater. 
So I'll go through the general fund first. <coughs> and I do want to say the city has many, many, many more funds than the general fund and the enterprise funds. We have grants. We have revolving funds. We have trust funds. Um, but the report that you get quarterly is mainly focused on the, the, the five largest funds in the city, which are the general fund and the, the four enterprise funds. So if you want to follow along, um, the first report that I'll go over is the revenue in the general fund. So you, sorry, just. If they're kind of hard if you're not familiar with them so you're going to look right up here at the top for which one it is yeah. and so you should have in front of you um, one that says up in the uh, left hand corner taxes and excise that's the first category um, taxes and excise consist of not only property taxes but they consist of other taxes that the city has such as excise tax that you pay for your car meals tax hotel motel tax uh, the adult use marijuana tax and pilot pilot stands for payment in lieu of taxes so I'll talk a little bit about um, some of these categories and the way the report is set up um, the columns that you should pay attention to are pretty much the last three columns. You can see the column titled actual year-to-date revenue tells you how much revenue has come in. It's a little disconcerting because they all have negative numbers, so, but they are good negatives. They are actually positive numbers. Um, it's just the way the accounting system records it and doesn't make sense, but don't worry, these are not negative numbers. So look at the column that says actual year-to-date revenue. The uh, column to the right of it is how much revenue remains to come in. And when the number is in the positive, it means it exceeded 100% of the original estimate. And the last column shows you the percentage that has been received. I'm paying attention to the percentages um, because I know how much I should receive of each of these um, categories by this particular time. So even though it's a halfway report, some of these I may have already know that I've received 100% or I know that I'm not going to get them until the last day of the year. That's somewhat typical with some state payments. They wait until the end of the year. So in terms of the first category, which is taxes and excise, um, three items that I'll call your attention to are the hotel motel and the meals tax. And I'd just like to give you a little sense of where we are. Um, for the hotel motel, um, the second quarter came in at 290000 It was 30% higher than the second quarter the previous year. So that's very significant. Um, so overall, right now, hotel motel compared to last year is running about 12% more than last year after two quarters. Um, with the meals tax, the second quarter meals tax came in 3.4% over last year's quarter at the same time. So meals are running just about the same. The first quarter was a little be below the previous year. So meals is pretty much the same as last year. Hotel motel has seen a big spike. Um, one reason it could have seen a spike is that the um, short-term rental uh, <coughs> option that you, that the council voted um, back in the spring has started to pick up. Unfortunately, the state doesn't break the revenue down. They just send us a check. So we don't know how much of this is related to the new revenue that we're getting from the short-term rentals, which would be like the Airbnbs, et cetera. Um, but I think we can attribute this uptick to, in part, to that short-term rental, because that is all new revenue for us. And we are hoping that the state would break that down for us, because it would be really nice to know. Um, but we haven't been successful in getting them to do that yet. Um, the adult use uh, marijuana, um, the mayor talked about that in his presentation last night. Um, the fourth quarter, I mean, excuse me, the second quarter payment that we got um, was about 100000 below the quarter before. And that could be in part because of the ban on vaping um, and our market share um, may be shifting with the opening of new stores. So this is something that we will be watching quite closely and um, because this is a huge revenue source, so we have to keep tabs on that. <coughs> Um, the rest of the category of taxes and excise, um, there's 
several that you'll see that say pilot, and you can also see that the no money has come in for them. Each of those pilot agreements were separately negotiated. They all have somewhat slightly different formulas. Um, the Smith College one it was negotiated with the whole development of Green Street. Um, the uh, temple uh, bought land from the city, so there was a separate pilot agreement, um, and so on. The fairgrounds, we have a, a separate pilot agreement. Non-Attuck Community School, when we sold that, we have a separate pilot agreement because it was sold to a, a tax-exempt organization. So all of these get billed after we set the tax rate because they're assessment is based on the tax rate. Um, but again, each one of these has a slightly different formula for calculating uh, what they owe the city. So those bills will be going out. They've actually, most of them have gone out and they'll be coming in, so you'll see those in the next quarter statement. The next category is charges for services. The three biggest things in this category is tuition for Smith Vocational, <coughs> ambulance revenue, and parking revenue. So the parking revenues are divided up among six or seven different lines. Um, and I have to kind of add them all together to kind of see where we are. But we're about just about where I thought we would be for parking it halfway through the year. Um, the mobile app revenue continues to grow. People really like Park Mobile, and it's very easy. It's very great for the city because it's very easy for us. We don't have to collect any money. We don't have to do anything. The money just comes in to the treasurer. So um, we like the Mo Park Mobile app, and definitely the customers do as well. Um, for ambulance service, um, you can see we're, um, we've brought in 1.1 million in revenue so far. We're at 61%. So that tells me that we're probably going to come in a little bit higher than, than we estimated. And that's a number that fluctuates every year. The next category is also called charges for services, but this is more departmental fees, uh, fees that people pay um, to get a birth certificate, um, departmental revenue that comes in from cemeteries, highways, auctions in the police department, board of health, hearing officer fees. These are, these are somewhat smaller items um, that, that come in. The next category is licenses <laughs> and permits liquor licenses, and this category I watch quite closely because it has um, all of the building permit revenue in it. So it has electrical permits, plumbing permits, building permits, and this is one of those that is highly dependent on the economy, and this gives me a sense if this is high, then I know that new growth might be higher, so this is directly related to we're looking at this because what's <coughs> happening now will generate the new growth for our 2021 budget. So we are watching this. Um, one thing I'll note, we, we also provide a sealer of weights and measures. And um, just so you know, we, um, do, we are the host community for a regional program that, that we, it is our program, and we provide sealer of weights and measure services to Granby, Amherst, Hadley, South Hadley, and East Hampton. So we receive a good chunk of revenue from doing that program. And we have John Fry, our sealer of weights and measures, who covers our town as well. Um, under federal revenue, at this point, there is only one line item left under federal <coughs> revenue. That is Medicaid from the schools. Um, this is for students who may be receiving eligible services in the schools. The schools are responsible for doing all of the paperwork involved in this, and the bulk of that reimbursement pretty much comes in in June. The, last, the next category is state revenue. And the state, this is where we get our Chapter 70 and our what's called UGA or the um, Unrestricted General Government Aid. I'm blanking out, yes. Um, this is where we get the two big pots of money that we get from the state as well as other smaller amounts. They pay quarterly, but um, there's one item called uh, school construction. And you can see they, they are slated to give us 1.1 million. They send that the last week of June. That is the last payment on the high school, because as the mayor said at the presentation last night, um, all of um, the debt exclusions, the police, I mean the um, fire station, the high school, and JFK will have be paid off. Um, high school's done by this year, and the only debt exclusion we have is the police station. So this is the last um, payment we'll be getting from the state for the high school. Um, the next category is fines, and there's only two line items there, parking tickets 
and um, motor vehicle and fraction fines. And then mm, uh, miscellaneous, we have interest on our investments. That's the money that the um, city treasurer is investing. And you can see so far, she's done quite well with that. Um, we have the veteran services. Um, that is the regional program where we provide services to, I believe, 11 towns um, for veterans. And um, kind of just a miscellaneous category. So if you come to the end, um, right now, we estimate we'll bring in $96.5 million in revenue, and we have brought in so far 45. We're at 47.1 percent, and that's pretty much where I would. Last year we were at 46 something, so we're a little bit ahead. So that is the revenue picture for the city, and the budget is organized essentially the same way as this. We use the same exact terms, the same exact line items, and the same exact categories. So when you follow along with this and you look at the budget, they will be they will be pretty much the same. Can Councilor Quinlan ask a question, and Councilor Labarge? Sure. The, so you mentioned last year it was 46 percent. This year it's 47.1. Uh, but last year, did it come in at 100 exactly? Last uh, year it, it exceeded it. it That's why our free cash was sure. so because we had the we had not bu built the 2019 budget using adult use marijuana because it didn't exist and right. DOR would not have let us. Um, so the money that came in for the marijuana revenue put us up over 100 percent. And there were other line items that came in higher than we anticipated sure. last year, too. Ambulance revenue was one of them. Thank you. Councilor LaMarche. Thank you. Um, Susan, I, if I can recall, we had a problem at one point with excise taxes, with people with boats and so forth like that, trying to get the money for that, and people had moved out of our city. Mm -hmm. How do you locate this people that you can't get the money from? Well, the deputy tax collector is, is a service that we hire, and they are the ones who track down people for so they do excise. Get them? Oh, yeah. They, uh, we mark them at the registry, so when people ultimately need to get their license renewed, we often get the money back. Because I know that yep. was a big problem in there for yep. a while. Yeah. Yep. Excise is a really big revenue source for us, and again, it is one that is very dependent on the economy. So there are certain lines in here that are always just going to you know, bump along the way that they do, but then there are ones that we really watch because they're telling us what's going on in the local economy, <coughs> the hotel, motel, the meals, the building permits, um, and, and parking, and, um, and other ones. Those are ones that we watch. Um, the motor vehicle excise tax comes in right now as 19 percent collected. Is that an actual amount, or is that where a lot of it comes in at w later? The bill, the bulk of the bills go out in February, so that's when excise goes out. Yeah. We get the bills from the registry, so that's we'll mail out 25,000 bills probably next month. Right. So, and uh, similarly with Smith Vocational at 30 percent. Is that similar? They, they bill every <coughs> month. Um, so they have, they actually have their tuition in one of our billing programs. And so they are sending it out to, I think, probably 30 or 40 different towns. And they're collecting every month. So they always bring in their full amount. Um, it just, it takes a while. Okay, any more questions on revenues? Okay, so we'll go to the second report, which is the general fund expenses. And um, you can, it starts with city council. And we have, in most of the departments, we have two lines. One's called PS and one's called OM. So PS is all of the salary lines. It's the permanent and regular salaries. It's overtime. It could be longevity, shift pay. Anything that's paid to an employee for the time that they've worked for the city would be in the category of PS. That stands for? Personnel, personnel. services, yeah. In OM, that's operations and maintenance, and that's basically any of the things that the departments need to run their departments. OM is where utilities would be, uh, supplies, um, repairs, maintenance, computer equipment, software, anything like that is in OM. And some um, of the departments might have a third category, which is called OOM, or capital, which stands for other than ordinary maintenance. And that's where they would pay for 
annual kind of capital items. So for instance, the police department, they purchase four or five uh, cruisers every year out of their regular budget. We do it out of the budget rather than the capital plan because they have to have new cruisers every year. Same with the fire department. They are always, um, we are always budgeting money in their capital item for, um, for the replacement of the ambulances. So certain departments might have a third category called OOM. The report that you get is, 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 a, is a summary report um, and it shows you where each of the departments are. Um, I'm watching this in terms of the percentage of the payroll um, that's used because I want to make sure that no department is exceeding the payroll and I know how many payrolls that we've had um, and I don't see on this particular report any, any issues to worry about. The OM, when you look at those percentages, it's not as helpful because some departments, for instance IT, is probably paying out 75 to 80 percent of their OM in, Jan in July when the new fiscal year starts. They're paying all of the software license fees. They're buying a lot of computer equipment. So the percentages are useful if you know what you're looking at. So the ones for payroll are very useful. The ones for OM, you kind of have to know what's going on in that department. Um, we organize the city budget in the same order um, as this document. So when you look at the city budget, all of the um, line items will be in the same order. We start with general government, which consists of the city council, the mayor, the auditor, the assessor, the collector, legal services, human resources, um, IT, city clerk, planning, and central services. And central services is the department that uh, oversees all of the buildings for the city. Um, then we group the next category in our budget document as public safety, which consists of police, parking enforcement, uh, the dispatch, fire rescue, inspections. Then the next category in our budget document is the schools, but you don't have the schools in this document because the school committee is in charge of their budget. You give them one number and they are getting uh, regular reports from their business manager documenting how their budget process is unfolding. So this document does not include the schools. Um, so the next group of um, departments in our budget and in this document would be the DPW and you have four categories there. You have admin and engineering, general highways, forestry and parks, and you have um, winter roads, uh, snow. Um, the next category would be the health, senior services, veterans, get the libraries, um, parks and rec, arts and culture. So on page six, I'll point out, um, you get to the debt service, and that is the that is basically our payments on all of the things that the city has borrowed. And that's in two line items. Um, uh, line item 710 is municipal debt service. That's the principal payment. And the one underneath is the interest. And that's the interest on all of our, our borrowing. So this will include not only the police station project, but all the other projects, the, um, the 2.5 million in paving that, the, that we are starting to spend, all of these payments are coming due here. Um, contributory retirement, the city it has its own retirement system and we are required to provide a uh, annual assessment for the retirement system for our employees and it is 6.3 million and we pay that the 1st of July. So that is, we pay that all at once, um, which is why, and there's a little bit left in that one. We have a couple of people who were not part of the retirement system. There's only three left and we have to pay another payment for them. I don't totally understand, but we have to do that. So that payment goes out in July. Now we're into other fixed costs that the city has, such as workers' comp, unemployment insurance, and then if you look at category 914, that is medical insurance. That is our probably our single largest department slash line item in the budget. That is um, all of the uh, city's health insurance for employees and retirees. This number includes those the retirees as well. Um, then you get into uh, cherry sheet assessments. Um, those are 
As I talked about in the revenue side, where the state gives us money, they give us Chapter 70 money, they give us UGA, they also take money back from us. So, and, and this is what on the slide that the mayor had up last night showed that you know what they give us and what they take away, at least in education aid, we kind of it, it is a net loss. But in general, Cherry Sheets assessments um, consists largely of charter school tuition and outgoing school choice. Those are the largest. It's categories. called the cherry sheet because it used to be red it or it used to red. be when I first started in municipal government they sent it out and it was on pink paper so that's why it's called the cherry sheet so and then the last page of the expenditures shows um, the capital improvements which is 930 and you can see that's a pretty um, large number um, if I were to give you the detail, that would probably have about 50 projects. Those are all the capital improvement projects that City Council has uh, funded that are not borrowed. Um, so these are all the projects that we paid cash for. So our capital projects are funded either in that debt line item or they're funded here as cash projects. And those carry forward from the prior year. So if you look at this line, you can see we carried forward 8.3 million from last year. And so these projects are ongoing. Um, and as they finish, if they have money left, we reprogram it. Um, the reserve for personnel is the only line item here that um, shows as a negative. Um, that uh, that line item was for the transfers that you made at the beginning of the fiscal year um, for all of the collective bargaining agreements that were settled. Um, out of this account also comes uh, payouts for employees when they retire if they have a sick leave benefit. Um, when we exceed that, we go to the other fund that you set up, uh, we set it up probably six or seven years ago, called um, the Compensated Absence Fund, where we put aside any money that's left over in this line from prior years, and in years where we might have more retirees than we typically do, we would put those expenses there. This expense has already been moved, but it got moved in January, so it doesn't show on this quarterly report. Um, and then lastly is uh, the last item is general liability insurance. So again, this is, document is organized the same way as our budget. So if you look at the budget and you look at this, you'll be able to um, see the connection between the two. Um, <clears throat> on, the line, on the issue of retirements and retirement obligations, um, is, is there any graph or change that indicates um, are liabilities increasing or decreasing or static? Um, I, I know it's dependent on surviving retirees, the amount of retirees, but is there a trend? And this also includes uh, for the healthcare costs that are associated with that too. Well, the, the, okay, so the retirement system is just the, the pension. It right. does not include our teachers. All of our retired teachers are in MTRB. So this is just our city um, employees. The retirement system every two years has to have an actuarial valuation. So we have to recalibrate um, our progress towards our goal because the law is by 2040, all of the systems in Massachusetts are supposed to be self-sustaining. And at that point, when we reach self-sustaining point, and hopefully by 2040, this six million, which by then will probably be 10 million, will no longer be an appropriation from the city. So once we get to full funding, we will not have this obligation because the, the employees will be fully funding their own retirement system. We are at about 65% right now. Um, there are very few systems, I, I can only think of one in the state that is close to full funding. The number, that percentage fluctuates every time we do the actuarial evaluation because the retirement board is using different metrics. So we used to use 7.75 as the interest rate. The advice from PERAC, which is the state agency that oversees all the retirement boards, is to start ratcheting that back. So we have each, every two years, we have ratcheted down a quarter of a percentage. So we are at 7.375. So that's what we're using for our assumption on the interest that we're gaining on all of our investments. The other thing that we were advised to do, which we have done, is we've adopted new mortality tables because people are living longer. So 
when you bring the interest rate down, you bring down that assumption, and you assume that your retirees are going to live longer, that moves the goalpost. And so when the goalpost moves, the gap that the city has to make up increases. So we have been probably doing, I'm, I'm guessing when I say this, but I think I'm pretty close, five or six percent a year, we have been increasing our retirement assessment because we want to get to full funding. Because when we get to full funding, we can take all of the money that we're putting into this appropriation and we can start funding the other big unfunded liability, which is health insurance for our employees, which is called OPEB, other post-employment benefits. So the plan, our plan for OPEB is when we finish paying for the retirement system, we will take that amount and we will shift it to fund the OPEB liability. So are the, the health insurance for the teachers, that's part of the school committee budget. So the teachers, their retirement is paid for by this, paid out of the state fund, MTRB, but the teachers are our liability for health insurance. They do not get their health insurance from the state. So when we show the pie chart that shows how much of the budget belongs to the schools, a lot of that employee benefits section belongs to the schools, not only for the current employees, but for the retirees. So. And the reason I ask, of course, is it's usually overlooked when we were talking about pressures on, on a budget, um, this dimension of it and our, and our devoted commitment to these agreements and arrangements and part of contracts. Mm -hmm. And it is our obligation to pay, but it is, it is a burden that expands. And, it, and as you said, the goalposts continue to move as we try to uh, accommodate it, but the fact is, is this is an ongoing pressure that will continue as, as mortality rates improve, as more retirements transition, that, that there will be obligations that the kind of unseen obligations don't show up as a fire truck and don't show up as a, as a building or anything else. This is, these are our commitment to our largest expenditure, which is the personnel in, in, the, in the city. And, and there were re reforms to the retirement system uh, done a number of years ago. Uh, you know, it used to be, it would be your three highest years would determine your, you know, the calculation for your pension. They've now expanded that to five years. They've changed um, age, age benefits as well. So they have tried to make the system less expensive in a way. Um, and employees are also contributing more. Most employees in the city are contributing about 11% of their salary um, every paycheck for retirement. So once we get caught up, and, and we are like every other system in the state, um, but once we get caught up, the employees will be fully funding their pension. Right. Mm -hmm. so. Councilor Labarge. Thank you. Um, Susan, say like what elected officials, city councilor, school committee, or whatever, and they're in term for four years. They have the health insurance because that is offered to all elected officials. So when, say they leave in four years or six years, what happens with that health insurance? You only qualify for health insurance in if you retire from the city. So at six years, you don't recover from the city. You have to work 10 years. And, this, and these rules are not the city of Northampton's rules, I want to point out. These are all governed by the state. That's we don't have a whole lot of say in these rules. We have our own system, but it is basically right. you know, run by the state. So you have to vet. It takes 10 years to vest in the system. So, and you have to, in, in order to get health insurance from the city, you have to retire from the city. With the 10 years. With at least 10 years. At least 10 years. Yeah. Thank you. Did I see a hand hmm. over here? Okay. You ready to move on to the enterprise funds? I don't need their insurance, but I... So the <laughs> enterprise <laughs> funds, um, there's a revenue page for those. Um, and the lines that I look at on these are the, are the sewer rates for the sewer and the water rates for the water. Um, you can see both of these were at 49.5, or for water, we're at 50.6, and that's exactly where we should be. Um, so these funds are pretty predictable. 
there's not a lot of variation in these. With water, sometimes if we've had a um, water ban, uh, water rates could dip a little bit because people are using less water. So that's a number that the DPW is always watching. But in general, there's very few surprises in these funds. Um, so you can see sewer revenue right now is at 52.7%. Water revenues at 52.6%. Storm water revenue is at 51.7, and solid waste uh, revenue is at 52.6. So I have no concerns with, you know, the revenue streams in any of these four funds. And then the, um, if you look at the enterprise fund expenses, you can see um, when you look at the percentages for the enterprise funds, you'll see that they're all about, they've only expended about 33 percent. That Percentage is a bit misleading because there are a lot of large multi-year capital projects that are folded in here. So you can see in that column that says transfers and adjustments that a lot of projects from prior years have been carried forward. So for instance, in sewer enterprise, um, the current year is 6.4, but we carried over 5 million of ongoing projects. Um, so that's why the percentages look low. It's just because these projects take a lot of time. There's often a lot of engineering involved in them. And so um, I just wanted to tell you the percentages are a little misleading because of that. Can you explain why we have enterprise funds and why, why these items are not part of the general fund and sort of mm -hmm. the difference? So these are run as utilities. Um, they are, enterprise funds are set up so that the users of the service are the ones paying for the service. So not everybody in the city of Northampton has sewer. Not everybody in the city of Northampton has water. Only the sewer <coughs> users are paying for sewer. Only the water users are paying for water. Only the people who are using the transfer station are buying trash bags. So these are to keep city services self-supporting, self-sustaining. If any of these were to come in the negative, the general fund would have to take care of that. But these funds have been in existence for a number of years in the city. We've never had an instance where any of them have come in in the negative. And all of these, you, as you remember, you have a sewer stabilization fund, a water stabilization fund, a solid waste stabilization fund, and a stormwater stabilization fund. So you have voted excess over the years into those funds. So they are self contained self-supporting <coughs> utilities that have their own set of reserves to call on if they needed to. Does anyone have any questions about yes. that? Yes. Thank there? you. Susan, on the um, sewer liens, how many liens do we have in the city for sewer? I don't know. I don't know. Those would be liens for non-payment. Um, people that have fallen behind in payments, just like with the tax, you know, property taxes. Um, so when someone is, um, when, when we are uh, having, taking for tax title, all of these things roll, the water, the sewer, all of these liens get protected when we, you know, put somebody in tax title. So eventually the city always gets it, the money that's owed to it. Um, but it just takes a process. We still have a, a system where if we do have residents who are going into a lane, a sewer lane, water lane, whatever, we don't we have a system where we attempt to try to help residents out by making payments and stuff? Absolutely. Any, any <laughs> residents that have fallen behind before they get into tax title can enter into a payment plan with the, with the treasurer. I think that's so, important. Yeah. That people know that. Yeah. That's what Jared. Um, could you explain what direct and indirect expenses and also reserve cap of those accounts are? I'm looking under sewer enterprise, but there's some throughout. Okay, so each of the enterprise funds pays to the city's general fund what we call indirect costs. And that is because the person who works in the, the people who work in the water department get their health insurance from the health insurance that's over here in the general fund. So the indirect charges are all of the services that are in the general fund that are benefiting these self-supporting entities. So for instance, the indirect would be made up of the, the portion of retirement for the you know, 
15 or 20 people that work in the water department. They have, they have an impact on the retirement assessment. So we do a calculation where we figure out this year, this is how much of the retirement assessment belongs to the water enterprise fund or belongs to the sewer enterprise fund. We figure out their health insurance by the person, you know, their health insurance. The, um, they also have a share of unemployment. They have a share of the property and liability insurance for the city, the general liability, because all of the facilities that the water and sewer enterprise use, they're all structures, they are insured by the city, and that insurance is paid over here in the general fund. So basically, the indirect is a bill to the utility individual bill to each utility for the portion of services that they are getting from the general fund. Um, they pay a very small share of the assessors, the, um, not the assessors, excuse me, the auditor and the treasurer collector because our treasurer collector is the one who collects all of the water bills and all of the sewer bills. So these are all services. So when you think of the enterprise funds, they are run like a like a little business and they are using our services and we are billing them for those services. So that's what the indirect um, charge is. Um, where you see reserve capital, there's um, two lines that you'll see that on. In sewer, the very last line, reserve capital, that is how much was in the sewer enterprise budget that was put into the sewer stabilization account. So they budgeted to put $1,086,000 into the sewer stabilization fund. Mm -hmm. And that sewer stabilization fund will be used for the planned renovation of the sewage treatment plant that is, uh, that is ongoing right now and is going to cost you know, well into the 20 so there structures are there structures in from are they funded from the central central services or from the enterprise the structures that the structures have. for the enterprise funds they have their own they pay their own electricity their own heat and that they have a if you look at their budget you'll see they right. have an electric line item so central services doesn't doesn't the oversee those buildings no okay i wanted to ask about uh the stabilization funds for each enterprise. You know, you mentioned that money goes in that's, you know, spare, right? If, 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 the, if that enterprise takes in more money, it goes into the stabilization fund. Is there a goal with those to be at a certain amount? Is it uh, unlimited? Are we just going to run, the, keep, keep adding to those as we go? Uh, you know, I'm just curious if there's a cap to those where, where we might look at that money and put it somewhere else. Um, well, the storm, the stormwater stabilization fund has about half a million dollars in it. It's the newest of all of the right. enterprise funds, so it's very small. Uh, the solid waste stabilization has 1.5 million in it. Um, that is being used for ongoing uh, closure costs related to the landfill that we closed and no longer operate, but still have expenses related to. Um, the water stabilization fund is at 2.7, and when you see the capital plan that'll come to the council in March, some of the money m to fund some of the equipment and needs of the water department will probably come out of this stabilization fund. So this is a place where we are building up reserves so that we can replace capital equipment. Uh, the sewer stabilization fund has the most money in it, and that is because we have been planning for many years for a renovation of the plant, which was built in the, was the 70s? Seven, yeah, so there's, there's a major renovation that's going to be happening, and as we finance that, we will use the money in the sewer stabilization fund to help keep rates stable, because this will be a very large project. Thank you. Any other questions? on Enterprise or on this mid-year report. Seeing none, thank you so much, Susan. Thank you for taking all that extra time. Clearly, this was really helpful for all of us. Yes. These were great questions, and <coughs> I really appreciate you going through that carefully with us. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next up, um, we have the financial orders for finance. Um, so these are all Community Preservation Act orders. And so we are going to be looking for a motion to um, recommend for um, to the council. So um, Sarah Lavalle is here, and she's been really patient and not feeling well. Um, Sarah, would you like me to go? Would you like me to 
read them, and then we'll go over them all together. Do you want to take them one by one? What's your preference? Uh, up to you. It doesn't matter. I have a, just a few words about the CPA itself, and, and then I could either speak to the projects one by one or... Okay. Um, okay, and, and I hope all the counselors got uh, received the letter from the chair of the CPC um, that kind of gives a little bit of a narrative as well. Um, so why don't I introduce them, and then Sarah will talk to us a bit about um, the CPC. So we have 20.007, which is an order to appropriate CPA funds for the historic preservation of Carson's House and Shepherd's Barn. Ordered that whereas Historic Northampton Inc. submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding for continued work to restore and reopen the Shepherd Barn and Parsons House, rebuild the Shepherd Porch, and purchase an art rack for safe storage and display of artifacts. Whereas CPA funds will be used to secure an important historic resource that is valued by the community and the region on which the city holds a permanent preservation restriction. Whereas the project has a great deal of community support and will further work and and will further and further work will be done at Historic Northampton over the past and further fur, and will further work at Historic Northampton there's something not quite will for, oh, will further work done at, thank yes. you <laughs> will further work done at Historic <laughs> Northampton over the past 10 it's the over that's getting me over the past 10 years will help uh, preserve the city's sense of place and includes contribution of extensive volunteer labor and materials Whereas all work will be consistent with the Secretary of the Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties. Whereas on November 20th, 2019, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $198,834 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $198,834 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to Historic Northampton, Inc. for the assessment and preservation project, and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee and the Mayor and the Council. Um, <coughs> specifically, $198,834 is appropriated from CPA Historic Preservation Reserve. Um, why don't I why don't I read all these through then Sarah will talk to us and then we'll um, we'll get motion uh, next we have 20.008 in order to appropriate CPA funds to purchase 105 acres in Rocky Hill Greenway order that whereas the Northampton Conservation Commission and Office of Planning and Sustainability submitted a Community Preservation Act application for purchase of 105 acres within the Rocky Hill Greenway at the former Pine Grove Golf Course whereas the parcel includes more than half a mile of Nashawanak Brook rep Riparian area is part of a wildlife corridor abuts existing protected area in the Rocky Hill Greenway and presents a myriad of opportunities for climate change adaptation, natural communities restoration and recreation. Whereas the project meets the goals of the sustainable Northampton plan, Northampton Community Preservation Plan and open space recreation multi-use trail plan to protect open space, provide for passive recreation and protect heritage landscapes. Whereas CPA funds will provide a match for a state local acquisitions for natural diversity grant. Whereas on November 20th, 2019, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $250,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Ordered that $250,000 be appropriated for Community Preservation Act funding to the Northampton Conservation Commission Office of Planning and Sustainability for the National Act, please tell me if I'm mispronouncing that, uh, Riparian Restoration Project, and that the grantee meets the conditions approved for the Community <coughs> Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and City Council. Um, <coughs> specifically, that $172,000 is appropriated from the CPA Open Space Reserve Account, and $78,000 is uh, appropriated from the CPA Undesignated Reserve Account. Then 20, uh, Point zero zero nine in order to appropriate CPA funds for affordable home on Glendale Road. Ordered that, whereas Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding for creation of an affordable single home on Glendale Road. Whereas Habitat for Humanity has an excellent record of creating housing throughout the Pioneer Valley and beyond, and has already created three affordable units on Glendale Road. Whereas the project has wide community support, leverages funding from many other sources, and utilizes volunteer labor. 
whereas the home will be restricted to individuals and families earning 60% of area median income or below. Whereas on November 20th, 2019, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $30,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $30,000 be appropriated from Community Preservation Act funding to Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity for Glendale Road Small Home Project, and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and City Council. Specifically, $30,000 is appropriated from the CPA Affordable Housing Reserve. 20.0110, in order to appropriate CPA funds to community builders for North Commons project. Ordered that whereas community builders submit an application for Community Preservation Act funding for creation of affordable housing units at North Commons project, whereas in conjunction with the Village Hill Apartments, the project will create approximately 65 units of mixed income rental housing at Village Hill on two parcels, and 35 of these will be restricted to households and individuals earning 60% of area median income or below. Whereas playgrounds and approximately 30 acres of open space are part of the project and will be open and available for use by the public. Whereas the community builders has an excellent record of providing affordable housing in Northampton and beyond. Whereas the project will leverage funds from a variety of other sources and has wide community support. Whereas on November 20th, 2019, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $250,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $250,000 be appropriated for Community Preservation Act funding to community builders for the North Commons project, and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and City Council. Specifically, $142,000 is appropriated from the CPA Affordable Housing Reserve, and $108,000 is appropriated from the CPA Undesignated Reserve Account. And the last one is uh, 20.011. In order to appropriate CPA funds to NHA for Northampton Heights Playground. Ordered that, whereas the Northampton Housing Authority submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding for playground creation at Hampshire Heights, whereas the Hampshire Heights development has never had a, develop a dedicated playground space, and the majority of its residents are youth and children for whom access to other playgrounds is limited. Whereas the project has wide support, including Hampshire Heights residents, the Housing Partnership, and Healthy Hampshire, and will continue to, to positive health status or will contribute to the positive health status of residents and enhanced quality of life. Whereas CPA funds will be leveraged by additional grant funding and donated labor and services, whereas on November 20th, 2019, Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend $200,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $200,000 be appropriated from Community Preservation Act funding to the Northampton Housing Authority for the Hampshire Heights Playground Project and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and City Council. Spe specifically, $200,000 is appropriated from CPA and is undesignated reserve. So those are the ones before us. <laughs> I think Sarah has a presentation. She does. Okay. But can we discuss them without putting them? No. Um, Sarah, would you like to come forward? You can move to put them on the floor, and then this is all part of the discussion. As a group? Yeah. Would someone like to make a motion to take these as a group to recommend to the council? Yes, I'd like to make a motion on the floor to seek these as a group. Second by Councilor Nash. And Sarah, would you? No. It's a Sorry. Second. 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 I'm a, Second. All these Irish guys look like. <laughs> It's all right. Oh, here Finland. It's actually that one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, for being sure. in. So, Sarah is the planning department's <coughs> person for the uh, Community Preservation Committee. Thank you. I know you don't feel well. We appreciate you being here. I apologize in advance for any sneezing and my hoarse voice. Um, but welcome to all the new counselors and welcome back to all of you who are joining us again. Um, as Gita Louise mentioned, I'm Sarah Lavalley. I'm the I'm a planner in the Office of Planning and Sustainability, and I'm also the staff to the Community Preservation Committee. Um, and in, in past years, people sort of got used to seeing these, so we didn't really have much discussion about the CPA itself. But before my presentation about the projects, I just wanted to give everybody a quick overview and opportunity to ask any questions. Uh, so the Community Preservation Act was passed by Northampton voters in 2005. It was, again, affirmed in 2011. The funding uh, for these projects comes from local 
a local property tax surcharge of 3% as well as a state match that's provided by registry of deeds fees. Um, the CPA in Northampton has contributed to more than 125 projects so far in all of the el eligible areas, open space, historic preservation, affordable housing, and recreation. Um, the Community Preservation Committee is comprised of nine members. Four of these are elected in appointment, and there are five representatives from other city boards and committees. Uh, the CPC makes recommendations for funding. It does this through two competitive evaluation rounds each year, so they seek um, grant applications, uh, hear those applications, and then make funding based on the, the viability of the projects and the funds available. So you generally see me twice a year. Um, all meetings are open to the public, and input from, and feedback is always encouraged. Each funding round has two um, public comment sessions where public comment on the applications is particularly sought, but all meetings have a, an open public comment at the beginning. Um, you can visit the CPC website for additional information, including all of the project applications and financial documents. And just an, a note about the orders and the, um, the accounts that things are coming from. By state law, at least 10% of CPA revenue each year has to be spent or set aside for open space housing and historic preservation projects. And uh, funding for, for those accounts, as well as any debt service repayments, is set aside each fall, so you'll see a separate financial order every year. Um, and that's, so that's why there's different accounts. And I have a presentation about these projects <coughs> that are being recommended by the committee this year. Um, they're not, it's a total of $928,824 in total funding recommendations this round. And a second round of fiscal year 20 applications is beginning now. Um, this is going to be a lot smaller than the first round. The committee has about $30,000 available at the moment. There is some as yet undetermined additional state funding that will be coming in. Uh, so the, the first one is the Historic Northampton Project. I think there was one slide, yeah, just before that. Historic Northampton provided the committee with some great photos, so I wanted to share those all with you. Uh, Historic Northampton is a um, repeat applicant to the Community Preservation Committee, and they've done some really good work so far. Um, some tremendous preservation work and a, a lot of uh, programming work that wasn't funded through CPA, and these are some examples of, of what's going on there. Uh, so now the Historic Northampton is looking for funding to do some structural assessments and open additional buildings to the public. One of these is the Shepherd Barn. Um, it, the, um, Historic Northampton now knows that the Shepherd Barn was built in uh, 1805 or 1806 based on a dendritic chronology assessment that was funded through the Community Preservation Committee. So that's a neat scientific um, study where a hole is drilled in a piece of wood and then um, they use uh, um, known pieces of wood and uh, climate, climate conditions in those years to figure out when it was built. Uh, so the, the goal of that project is to uh, restore the barn and open it to the public and display some artifacts that are currently in there but haven't been seen by the public for quite some time. And then next slide. Let's go backwards. Next one. Um, the, the Parsons House, this has been closed off to the public for a long time, but the, it's a really great example of um, not only the period when it was built, but different renovations that were made over the years. Instead of ripping out um, prior work from different eras, it was just covered up so you can cut a hole in the wall and have a little time capsule. Uh, so that work will be funded by this project. And then there might be one more. No, nope, that's the last one. Um, so the Rocky Hill Greenway, this is a project that was approved by the City Council last summer. Um, this is matching a state local acquisitions for natural diversity grant. And two readings of this one are being requested because the Office of Planning and Sustainability is excited to begin restoration work there. Um, the golf course is a tremendous opportunity. It connects to a lot of existing open space, which is shown, shown around the golf course in red uh, by the outline in black. Um, but you know, it's been heavily altered over the last 50 years. But <laughs> by golfing uses, there's a lot of work that needs to get done. Uh, Office of Planning and Sustainability has applied for a grant from the um, from the state to do a lot of restoration work, and that hasn't been announced yet, but um, the city's really um, op optimistic about that, and it, that should be announced within the next few weeks. So you can see catch basins that have been installed and berms, there's some sheds and things that really need to get done as quickly as possible. Yes, um, I have a question. We'll go back on that. At the um, Pine Grove yes. Golf Course. We're looking at 105 acres of conservation land. 
How many acres are wetlands? Well, currently, not really very many because the drainage tiles and catch basins were installed to funnel water as quickly as possible away from the golf course because it's no fun to hit a golf, bar, a golf ball in a swamp uh, towards the streams. So currently, if you, if you look at the vegetation, if you dug a test pit, it, it's, that would not be a wetland. Um, because it's, the drainage has been altered, but once it's restored to its pre-golf course I have conditions, been asked by some that. people, um, because of the price here, and we're looking at 105 acres, and I want to clarify this, that the significant difference between conservation land and wetlands, because I think with wetlands, when the city goes and buys wetlands with conservation land, if I can recall, that it was eight hundred to a thousand dollars an acre for wetlands. So, what is the price of just strictly conservation land, at say per acre? Sure. Uh, so every every parcel is different, and there's um, every owner has a different set of needs. But there there definitely are are different. Uh, price considerations for what we call backland prices, something that has no frontage or could never be developed, or something that clearly has development value. Because of Pine Grove's past use as a golf course and how heavily disturbed it is, it's, it would definitely be developable. Um, if it had been left as, as forest and wetlands, then that would have been a lot more challenging. But there are some different um, performance standards in state law for development and unaltered areas. Thank you. Tremendous amount of wildlife out there. Yeah. I have I some do. friends that live around in that area constantly. You see deer out there, not one or two. You're going to see like 20, 18 of them. It's unbelievable out there. Turkeys on Wilson Avenue is phenomenal. They're all over the place. But I also think that we're looking at a pond or something. Isn't there? We're dealing with... <coughs> or something in yeah, so, um, so Nashawana Brook flows through the, the middle of the property. Um, if anybody's familiar with it at all or has, has golfed there or looked at a, um, an overhead map that shows t um, wetlands on it, there is, there is a pond um, that was created by damming the stream. So we are inheriting that. Um, we don't think that's an issue. It could be a, a great opportunity mm -hmm. for some additional wildlife enhancement. Okay. So this, this is only funding the CPA um, portion of the acquisition. This isn't um, additional funding for any restoration at this point. Because there has been such a huge controversy going on in this city that we are buying that whole golf course over there. And I know the mayor has been stressing it, I've been stressing it, <coughs> of exactly what we're buying here. And I do know the people that are and who own that property they also are subdividing, and I want people to understand this. They are subdividing large lots, four of them, okay, which will bring in a tax um, break here for the city. So we are strictly looking tonight at the conservation land. This is it, the 105 acres. If you, um, the carved out lots are actually shown on the map, but it's um, on the western portion of the property. There's a, an L-shaped carve out from the, the area shown in red. So those, that is the area that will be retained by the current property owner and then be, be developed. So that's the driveway that, and the, the clubhouse. Right. And the, I've seen the plans already um, on the houses that will go up there. Thank you. I'm sorry, I know you said it, but I missed it. Um, can you tell me the difference again between the red area and then the black outline? So the, the black outline around the, the golf course shown in red is uh, adjacent protected open space that's okay. owned by the city. Thank you. Any other questions before we move on with the presentation? No? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, and the, the Glendale Road small home, um, it was an application by Habitat for Humanity. They're, they have also come to the Community Preservation Committee and City Council previously for funding for some really successful projects. Um, this was a um, this is an area off of West Hampton Road and Glendale Road that was primarily protected for open space, but four small lots were carved off for affordable housing. So this is will be the last of those. And the next slide shows two of the homes that have already been completed. Um, a third one is underway, and the CPA funding will help. Those are the set last in the back. 
How big is the um, the one that's going in the front, the small house? I, How many bedrooms do you know? I believe they're, they're one or two bedrooms, uh, and they're less than 800 square feet. So they're, they're small houses. Um, is that the handicapped accessible one? That I don't know. Um, this habitat was trying to fill a need for, rather than only strictly providing homes for families, but um, for smaller families and individuals. We have to be very, very thankful for habitat. You know, they put in so many affordable housing compared to affordable apartments. And this is what people are asking for in the city is affordable housing. And they do it. Habitat is excellent. And um, most uh, housing projects are required by the Community Preservation Committee to have an affordable housing restriction that, depending on the project, could be mm -hmm. up to as, as many as 99 years. Habitats are forever. Mm -hmm. So th this will be affordable housing in perpetuity. So in other words, they buy it, which they are, and if they go to sell it, it has to stay as affordable housing. Correct. Any other questions on Glendale Road? It's a good deal. <laughs> and another affordable housing project, the, the North Commons in Village Hill. Uh, this will have a 99-year affordability restriction. This is um, another good deal, too. Because of the CPA involvement in this project, that's increased from the state requirement of, um, I, of I, I think, about 30 years. So this is um, one of the last development projects at Village Hill. This was also, this, a portion of this was also funded through MassWorks grant. That was recently announced, so the, uh, the MassWorks will contribute to the to running utilities and doing the paving for this project. And this one is uh, uh, in addition with the uh, Village Hill Apartments project, which is nearing completion now. This will contribute towards 65 units of mixed income rental housing, and 35 of these will be affordability restricted. And the, the Community Preservation Committee was really impressed with the level of neighborhood support for this project. Councilor LaBarge. Thank you. So we're looking at playgrounds, open space. We're looking at a total of 65 units, correct, mixed, or either affordable. So we're going to go into 30 units of mixed and 35 of low income. That's Correct. what we're looking yep. at. Um, and several of these, are they're not reflected in the affordability order here, but they're workforce housing, which is definitely a needed type of housing in Northampton, but isn't technically eligible for Community Preservation Act funding, but it is still critical. And are they going to put in more playgrounds and so forth? Like yes. That? There, that yeah, there is a playground associated with this project that will also be open for the larger Village Hill neighborhood. They're great. Community builders is fantastic. Any other okay. questions or comments on North Commons project? Well, uh, oh, I'm just, so sorry. No, I'm sorry. Just came, just a comment. I mean, uh, the Village Hill project has been going for 30 years, I think. Yes. And in fact, actually, this is one of the primary incentives for the project was to provide for affordable housing. Um, there was some disappointment with the fact that it wasn't the original intentions and goals were um, apparently not practicable um, of the the to the extent of the inventory but this this part of the project is part of the project I've been waiting for for some time for this and I'm I'm very excited to see the funding and the commitment from the CPA for this uh, this was also a project that's come to the Community Preservation Committee a, a few times for funding, but wasn't able to be funded all in <laughs> one shot due to the level of requests, but the, the committee was incredibly supportive of it. But, and it's worth noting the CPA is actually, um, you know, part of the impetus for, the, for this project to move forward and, and to actually be realized, so mm -hmm. that's, I'm grateful for that. Councilor Mayari? Yeah, I was just going to ask, is this part of the Smart Growth uh, District overlay, this Part of the village hill? Uh, yes, the, the entire village hill area is part of the planned village district. It's huge. Any other questions? No. Moving on to Hampshire Heights Playground. Uh, last one. Um, every, not every year, but every once in a while, the committee gets an, an application that um, has a, a lot of people come to speak in favor of it. Um, 
sometimes these are kids. This was one of those. So the committee got to hear from a lot of residents about how important this would be for them. Um, Hampshire Heights is one of the oldest public housing complexes in Massachusetts, which I didn't actually realize before this application came in. It does not have a playground. It's never had a playground. Um, Jackson Street isn't available for families to utilize during school hours or during after school programs. Um, the, the photograph shows the area where the playground will be developed. It's, it's not really much of anything to speak of currently. And it's still in the, the draft phasing um, along, and there's a lot of community involvement going on, but here's one of the draft plans to show how this can be turned into a, a great space for kids to utilize. Um, and the application included a lot of um, ideas from kids and, and support from kids, so that was great to see. So I know there's, <laughs> I think that's, those are the raised garden beds over there, to because I know they've been creating yes. a really, a fairly extensive garden for the residents. Um, so that's, that will be near it, but isn't taking that space. It is not, no. Um, and adult residents of Hampshire Heights spoke about how important it was for them to be able to work on their garden and watch their kids uh, enjoying themselves <laughs> and getting exercise at the same time. We did a planting day this last summer there, and it was, it's exactly, there were children everywhere playing and planting, and um, the idea that they could play in the playground and then come and participate and go back and forth seems really lovely. So. Councillor Quinlan, please. Well, I, I had a chance to spend some time in Hampshire Heights recently um, at a Families with Power event, and they're just so excited about this, so I, I just want to say thank you. Uh, I think that's that's really great stuff. Councillor Labarge. Thank you. What is the percentage of children? Do, do, do you know, yes. Councillor? Mm. Is it what, 50, so, uh, 55, 65, Yeah, 65, yeah. I, don't know. Half the houses, yeah. I know there's quite a bit, and I think this is great. I really do, and I know also up in Florence Heights, hopefully we can do, look at some renovations on that too. It's been this, a long time. This was the first application that's come to the CPC from the Housing Authority, and the, uh, we look forward to working with them more if possible. It's 65%. That was in the letter from yeah. Chair Adam. To that point, actually, Hampshire Heights has been discussing this, at least in my memory, for 25 years. The residents of Hampshire Heights, the uh, Housing Authority, not so much. There were always, I, I, I don't know, there were a variety of reasons that were offered why this could never be realized. And I was very excited to suddenly see that that, whatever hurdles that seemed to exist previously no longer exist, and the fact that they're committed to this. Because there have been stressors in, the, in there was the abutting parking lot, there was a child that was killed there 10, 15 years ago. No, not even that much. It's about ten years ago. Um, riding his bike, um, where where the um, Salvation is the Salvation Army, um, and and there are no real comfortable, serviceable places access to stores that are safe within safe walking distance. You have to cross uh, King Street at that at the Damon Road intersection, Bridge Road intersection. Hampshire Heights has a number of pressures on them without much accommodations, particularly for um, community and youth involvement. And I'm very impressed with the trend that's now occurring at Hampshire Heights where there is the understanding that this is a community, it is a neighborhood, and it is functioning as such, and then and even addressing the, the needs in particular of kids. And Jackson Street has served as that, Jackson Street School has served as that center for a long time, but this is, this is something on the campus that mm -hmm. makes so much sense. And I, I'm, again, also grateful to the CPA to be contributing to this mm -hmm. and, and helping this along. It's, it, it, I can see why you were excited, so. Oh, Councilor Barge. Just quickly. Um, there, I think there's going to be quite a bit of volunteers helping out with this project, correct? Yes, absolutely. Any other questions or comments for Sarah before we can let her go and rest up? Sarah, you want to go? <laughs> this is early. This is it's so bad. And I, I am happy to stick around for the full council discussion if you need me to. Um, does, does anyone feel like when we take these up in a moment in council, they would like to ask Sarah something that they can't ask her right now? Because if not, I would love to tell her that she could go. Is that okay? Any last thing you want to ask? No? Sarah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I hope that you feel better. Thank you.
<laughs> Thank you. So these are so just finance committee members. These are on the floor as a group. Yep. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so all those finance committee members, um, they're in favor of a positive recommendation of this group of community <coughs> preservation committee recommendations to recommend to the council to, to move our recommendation to the councilor. Council, will you please say aye? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Okay, so those move forward to the council with a positive recommendation. Yeah. And. <coughs> what's that? Adjourn. Yeah, we have not that those, that's it on this agenda. There's no new business that I know of. Um, I have a motion to adjourn from the Finance Committee. <laughs> okay. No. Second. Second. Seconded by Councillor Quinlan. Thank you. We are adjourned out of finance. Okay. Let me get my piles. <laughs> oh, all those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Everyone eyed? Aye. Any objections, any abstentions? No, you can't abstain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We've adjourned from finance. We've now moved back into council. President Chia, I just had a very quick uh, point of clarification or interest. How did the finance uh, committee get uh, couched within the um, larger council is that a, a transparency uh, That's good. does anyone know the history i know some of it it actually it's it's kind of a legacy from when the mayor used to preside over the city council mm -hmm. and the mayor set the agenda and the mayor presented the finance uh, oh, budget okay. and sense. then in when we changed the charter and we created the separation of powers it was felt that it served a dual purpose. It, it was uh, it made expedient sense, as you see, it afforded the opportunity for all committee members to discuss financial issues, and it also could be vetted in the public, which tends to be the it's you know one of the more important things that we do. So it's it, it, it rather than creating a separate meeting, although they do exist, the opportunity for that, but to have the recommendations come through while we're sitting in committee, we thought, what the hey. Someday I'll, we can talk about the whole second reading thing too. <laughs> Unique mystification that's part of Northampton's yeah, legacy. I know. I, I, I said. I look forward to that discussion. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. On the agenda. Um, okay. So now we're moving on to financial orders. These are going to seem very familiar because we just did them. Um, so we are. These are first reading on these financial orders. Um, so for, we'll take these one by one and we'll do a roll call for these. Uh, the first one is 20.007, in order to appropriate CPA funds for historic preservation of Parsons House and Shepherd Barn. Move to approve. Second. It's been made by Councilor LeBarge, seconded by Councilor Dwight. Is there any further discussion on this? No? Roll call. Roll call, please, Laura. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Foster? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Labarge? Present. I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 That passes in first reading. Um, second is 20.008 in order to appropriate CPA funds to purchase 105 acres at former Pine Grove Golf Course. Move to approve, please. Second. Been made by Councillor Dwight. Second. So we're going to give a second to Councillor Jarrett. Um, is there any discussion on this order? No. Um, Laura, would you do a roll call? And I'll, I just want to point out real quick. So you you'll notice that we um, how we do our roll calls is we start alphabetic. We we start alphabetically and then we rotate one down. So um, it will be a different person who starts this time and a different person who ends this time. Councillor Foster? Yes. Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Mayori? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor Quinlan? Yes. Councillor Sheriff? Yes. Councillor Thorpe? Yes. And Councillor Yes. Move to suspend the rules to allow for a second reading, please. So second reading's been requested. So mm -hmm. the motion's been made and seconded to suspend our rule that we do two readings on two separate days. All those in favor of any discussion on suspending the rule? All those in favor of suspending the rule to have two readings on this order, please say aye. 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 Any objections? 
Move to second reading. Second. Second reading's been moved by Councillor Dwight, seconded by Councillor Labarge. Um, any discussion on second reading of this order? Hearing none, another roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. 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 That passes uh, entirely in both readings. Um, we're up to 20.009 in order to appropriate CPA funds for affordable <laughs> home, affordable home on Glendale Road. This is the first reading. Um, Move, uh, approval, please. The motion's been made by Councillor Dwight. Say aye. <laughs> Go ahead, second. Second. I second. seconded by Councillor Mayori. Is there any discussion on this order? Seeing none, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Lavar. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shira. Yes. Councillor Thor. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. And Councillor Yes. That passes in first reading. Moving on to 20.010 in order to appropriate CPA funds to community builders for North Commons Project. Let's go approve. Second. The motion's been made by Councillor Labarge, seconded Second. by Councillor Dwight. Is there any discussion on this order? Oh, Councillor Jarrett. Um, yeah, I just wanted to speak. Uh, I was part of the North. I was part of the Northampton Housing Partnership while this was moving along, um, and I just really like this project because of the open space will be close by. Um, it's an easy walk to town. There's public transit available, um, not far. There's and one of the disappointments about um, Village Hill is kind of the lack of commercial development that has happened um, that provides business you know businesses that are accessible to the residents you know that would provide services for those residents and as we build sufficient density um, <clears throat> I think that that may start to happen because the businesses need that density uh, of people who can you know patronize those businesses and that hopefully will have business there so uh, building this out further and having the be affordable that significant percentage being affordable is really great thank you any other comments on this project no okay uh, roll call please Laura Councilor Mayori yes Councilor Nash yes Councilor Quinlan yes Councilor Shara yes Councilor Thorpe yes Councilor Dwight yes Councilor Foster yes Councilor Jarrett yes and Councilor Lavard yes that passes in first reading and we're up to 20.011 in order to appropriate CPA funds for NH for Northampton Housing Authority for Hampshire Heights Playground. Move to approve. Second. It was, the motion was made by Councillor Labarge, seconded by Councillor Maori. Seconded by Councillor Thorpe. <laughs> Thorpe. <laughs> seconded by Councillor <laughs> I want a buzzer, you know. <laughs> I want to feel like I'm going to win. <laughs> yeah, that'd be perfect. <laughs> Um, is there any discussion on this order for the playground? Councilor Chair. Yes. Um, another one that, has, uh, when I was on that housing partnership, uh, worked with this. And But I wanted to speak about the need for playgrounds to be accessible and local. Um, one of the things when I was on the campaign trail, I heard from a lot of people uh, who lived, who grew up here, um, and, you know, 40, 50 years ago, how how much uh, the close travel, you know, there were neighborhood schools, young children could travel to the schools um, without having to be driven there or take the bus. And um, there were playgrounds at those schools as well that were available. <clears throat> and, you know, we consolidated schools that saves money and provides more resources in those schools. But I really think we need to bring back local walkable areas where children can play and can safely get to. And from, um, and you know, these, this is available to Hampshire Heights, but it's also available to uh, anyone else around. You know, the I, it's not called Hampton Gardens Hathaway anymore. Farm. Hathaway, Hathaway Farms. Farms. Yeah. They can walk around quickly and get to that at any time. Um, and um, also, the community garden plots as was mentioned. It's a really great addition. So, and it's it's a, it's a step forward to correcting the inequities 
in public housing. Mm, thank you for that. Any other comments on the playground? Great project. Um, OK. Roll call, please. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor Quinlan? Yes. 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 Great. That passes in first reading. So now we move on to financial orders in second reading, but we don't have any, nor do we have um, other orders. So we're moving on to things that have not yet been referred. So I'm going to be looking for a motion to refer these. Um, First, we have a set of zoning um, ordinances. Can I, can I make a motion to start with uh, to move them as a group before you read them all? Mm -hmm. And and and, and and the motion to re refer them to uh, planning and to uh, legislative matters. Okay, so they've there's been a motion to move them as a group to and, planning. And if I could explain, just so I don't I don't want to fast. I don't want to pull a fast one on anyone. Um, this is just to expedite. Normally, on referrals on zoning issues, we uh, if we're referring it, we're not debating it on the floor as it goes. We're going to just send these off after reading to the various committees for a further, more expanded conversation. So, the reason I'm moving them as a group is just to expedite the process, as it were. And since they're all very similar. <coughs> It's appropriate to dis to move them forward as a group. If they were more disparate, then it would be better make more sense to separate them out, and they'll both be for at least to the two committees I recommended. Um, other councils are um, uh, able to uh, add other committees if they prefer. Okay, so it's been made and seconded to move them as a group to legislative matters. And to planning. So let's say what they are. So it's 20.004, an ordinance to rezone eight Con Street parcels from um, NB, 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 is neighbor, 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 neighbor business. business. Thank Central you. Business. To Central Business CB. 20.005, an ordinance to amend the zoning map on Old South Street and Clark Avenue. And 20.006, an ordinance to amend zoning map to add new smart growth overlay district at Laurel Street. So the motion has been made to move those as a group. To those two um, committees, any? I think it was Councillor Labarge. Um, any discussion on that motion? I would just like to know the difference between central and neighborhood, just for my own. Uh, uh, is that not that, time to talk about that? Or? It's. It's it's basically the limitations and and what's allowed and what's not allowed. Yeah. It does. It's a little more expansive conversation to, okay. to explain That's what fine. that is, we but that it. will come up in either planning and probably legislative. Better, you'll you'll get an earful in, in legislative yeah. matters. Okay, thank you. And they'll be they'll be explained by somewhere from planning. Um, any other discussion on this group moving to those two places now? All those in favor? Aye. Say aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? No. Okay, those have gone on to planning and legislative matters. Um, then next we have another ordinance um, to be referred. Um, this is an ordinance relative to demolition review for historically significant buildings. There a motion to refer this. It has to go to legislative matters. I, did this come out of planning? Is that where this came from? It came from planning. Yeah. Came from the historical commission. Came from the historical commission. Yeah. yeah. Any reason to send this to planning? Is there? I mean, I I would move to refer it to legislative matters. And. Is there a second? I'll second that. Seconded by Councillor LaBarge. Any discussion on Councillor Nash? Well, I, Councillor Dwight speaking to that, I, I would think that the planning board would want to weigh in on this because I would think it'd be part of the planning process. That if somebody's looking at a site that has a, possibly has a historic structure, um, since this is the mayor's 
Yeah, maybe. Ordinance, what, what do you have anything you want so to the convention <laughs> delay ordinance gives that authority to the historical commission. So they're the ones that review any project. So both the planning board will review it to conform with zoning, but the historical commission has its own separate authority. Um, so that's why they're proposing some changes to basically some of the cutoff points for what what constitutes a historic structure. So the planning board doesn't really have any purview. It, this is a separate <coughs> permit that you would need to get from the from the historical commission. Yeah. So I don't. I mean, I just don't know that the planning board would weigh in on it because it's really not their purview. So. Okay. But yeah, that was the. Right. Right. Councilor Quinlan. But would that be referred? Uh, to the historical commission by the planning commission if someone bought a property and, and was applying for a permit to make some adjustments some changes to the property how would um, that get there the building commissioner is sort of the gatekeeper for all okay. permits so anytime somebody applies um, and they would rule on um, whether you know finding was necessary or in this case whether um, a building was historically significant and then had to go um, for a hearing um, I'm trying to think of something recent uh, there, you may yeah, have seen that just one on Bridge Road, right? It's <coughs> my Bridge Road yeah. next to your house. Yeah. Um, those of you who've been following the project on Finn Street, there was a demolition there, so that had to go to the historical commission. So, um, so they sort of get fanned out if something's triggered. Uh, so that's how it would happen. It wouldn't go from the planning board to the historical commission. It would go right to the historical commission. Great, thank you. Any other, any further discussion? Other questions? No. Okay, all those in favor of uh, referring this to legislative matters, please say aye. 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 Any objections? Abstentions. Okay. Um, and uh, I don't know of any new business. So the last thing on our agenda. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Is there a second to that motion? Second. Seconded by Councillor Foster. Yes. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.